Can we detect myeloma even sooner? Dr. Batani, would you like to take it from here? Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the invitation and thank you uh, for coming on this wonderful Saturday morning to attend this. It's an absolute pleasure to be talking to this wonderful group of people. So the question that I will be addressing today is, can we detect myeloma even sooner? Early detection of disease is crucially important because if we know better, we do better. Um, timely diagnosis of myeloma could minimize associated complications, it could improve quality of life, and it could also improve overall survival if we start treatment in a timely manner. So the earliest we could detect multiple myeloma is at a precursor asymptomatic stage called MGUS. And the first half of my slides, I'll be discussing about what MGUS is. And during the second half, I will we'll discuss about how we can, whether we are justified about screening MGUS. So monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance, or as we commonly call it as MGUS, um, is a plasma cell disorder with a relatively benign course. It is a precursor condition that happens several years prior to the diagnosis of multiple myeloma, and often it is undiagnosed. It's a disease of elderly population. If we go ahead and screen people more than 50 years, we'll find that the incidence is around 3 to 5 percent, but the incidence increases to about 9 percent for octogenarians. And, um, it's important to remember that only a small proportion of patients with MGUS will ever progress to multiple myeloma. However, all patients with multiple myeloma once had MGUS. And this was the study that was published by Ola Langren in the journal Blood. Among 77,000 um, healthy subjects enrolled on a PCLO cancer screening trial, 71 developed multiple myeloma. All these patients had their serum collected and stored from two to 10 years prior to the diagnosis. And when they went back and looked into these serum samples, they found that MGUS was present in all cases, thus confirming that MGUS always precedes the diagnosis of multiple myeloma. So what truly causes MGUS is not entirely known, but there are certain factors that we know that can increase the risk of developing MGUS. And these are African-American or black race, male gender, older age, having a first degree relative with MGUS or multiple myeloma, immunosuppression as in having a history of HIV or organ transplant recipients, and then exposure to certain environmental hazards and radiation. But as I said, the, what exactly causes MGUS is largely unknown because there are several other factors that we don't know of yet. And, um, so you have heard a lot about what, uh, how does MGUS originate? So it is, the plasma cells are the white blood cells of B cell family that are present in the bone marrow. And in a normal person, these plasma cells produce various different kinds of antibodies that we call polyclonal immunoglobulins that help fight infections against viruses, microorganisms, and bacteria. But in MGUS, these plasma cells become abnormal they establish a clone called monoclonal plasma cells, and then they start producing one type of protein in excess called M protein or monoclonal protein. So as the disease advances, the size of the M protein increases and the level of the, and the number of the plasma cells in the bone marrow also increases. So in addition to primary and secondary genetic changes that are happening within the plasma cells, there are also changes happening within the bone marrow microenvironment and also in the host immune environment uh, that are really important as the disease progresses from MGUS to multiple myeloma along the spectrum. Um, and so diagnosis is oftentimes made incidentally by chance, usually during investigation of other uh, conditions. Uh, when MGUS is suspected, your doctor will order these three simple tests. And most of the times, uh, we are able to detect monoclonal gammopathy with the help of these three tests. So as you heard about it earlier, serum protein electrophoresis, or as we call it as SPEP, um, is a blood simple blood test that tells you what the quantity of M protein in the blood is. So it tells you whether it's 0 0.6, 1.2, or 3. 
whereas immunofixation, as shown in the middle um, here, tells you what type of immunoglobulins or M protein are present in your blood. So for example, here it shows that it is IgG lambda kind of M protein which is present. Um, and free light chain assay is really important for those 15% of cases where um, it's just the free light chain MGUS only. In those cases, SPEP and immunofixation will be negative. So this test is really important. And once these tests um, tell us that there is MGUS or monoclonal gammopathy present, then your doctor will determine whether you need imaging or bone marrow biopsies to confirm or dismiss the diagnosis. Um, and now we have this additional test, um, which is called mass spectrometry. This is more sensitive compared to uh, SPEP and immunofixation, but because it can detect even lower level of blood proteins present in the blood and so that we can make the diagnosis even earlier. It depends upon the molecular mass of the M protein, and this is unique to each patient. So here we are having like a personalized disease monitoring for each patient. So this is still an experimental approach. Not every lab can perform this test, but I'm sure that in the coming years, we will be seeing this becoming a standard test. Um, and depending upon um, what type of immunoglobulins the MGUS or the plasma cells are producing, we can have three different subtypes of MGUS. Each has a distinct rate and type of progression. The most common is non-IgM MGUS. It accounts for 85% of the cases. Most common is IgG followed by IgA. And this type of MGUS progresses to multiple myeloma or solitary plasma cytoma and rarely to AL amyloidosis. Uh, whereas IgM MGUS has lymphoplasmacytic features, and this is the type that can progress to Waldenstorm macroglobulinemia or a type of non-Hodgkin lymphoma, and rarely it can progress to AL amyloidosis and very rarely to IgM type of multiple myeloma. And then we have light chain type of MGUS, which can progress to light chain multiple myeloma. And not everyone with MGUS progresses to multiple myeloma. In fact, only 20% of patients over a period of 20 years would progress. So on an average, the rate of progression is 1% per year. And there are certain risk factors that have been shown to determine the rate of progression as I have shown them here. If you have none of these risk factors, then the rate of progression is extremely slow. So it's about 5% in 20 years as shown in the top bar. And if all three risk factors are present, then the risk of progression is higher. It's about 55, 58% as shown in the uh, bottom bar. But it's important that the initial low risk may convert to intermediate or high risk prior to transition to uh, multiple myeloma. So lifelong follow-up of MGUS is truly necessary. Um, and in addition to specific risk that the MGUS might progress to multiple myeloma or to smoldering multiple myeloma, there are several other problems of clinical significance where a small M protein or a B cell clone or a plasma cell clone can cause serious or even life-threatening diseases other than the tumor burden. So as we all know, MGUS can progress to AL amyloidosis, which is a serious disorder. MGUS can be associated with a whole spectrum of renal diseases called uh, monoclonal gammopathy of renal significance. MGUS can be associated with various skin conditions. It can cause various different types of neuropathies. And pa uh, patients with MGUS can have, have higher risk of thrombosis, infections, osteoporosis, and fractures. So it is really important to recognize these conditions and carefully exclude other causes so that appropriate plasma cell clone-directed therapy or clone-directed therapy can be given. So as I said earlier, if we know better, we do better. Um, so how is MGUS treated? Persons, those who are diagnosed with MGUS do not need treatment unless they choose to take part in a clinical trial because we do not have evidence yet that treatment will improve outcomes. So standard of care still remains periodic follow-up and monitoring. Um, and for patients who have monoclonal gammopathy of clinical significance, if there are problematic symptoms, 
a shared decision can be made with your physician to treat that condition. There have been studies that have shown that if a patient with multiple myeloma um, has been diagnosed previously with MGUS and were regularly followed, they had a longer survival compared to those who were de novo diagnosed with multiple myeloma without prior knowledge of MGUS. Um, so the things that I have not shown here, but it's really important for you to understand is that only 10% of patients with multiple myeloma have a prior clinical diagnosis of MGUS. And only 20% of prevalent MGUS cases are clinically recognized, which means that 80% or 2.8 million individuals living in the US uh, with MGUS are not clinically recognized. So we neither seek them out and we nor we follow them their clinical course. Uh, and this, and when we think about our African American communities, the magnitude of unrecognized mag, um, MGUS cases could be even greater because of the following reasons: MGUS is two to three times higher prevalent and uh, at a higher rate in Caucasian in uh, African Americans compared to Caucasians. MGUS occurs at a younger age, and MGUS has features associated with a higher risk of progression to full-blown multiple myeloma in African American. So, however, the challenge here is that most of the studies to date have included predominantly white population with negligible representation from African Americans. So we do need more studies that are focused primarily on African American groups so that we can learn about the risk factors, biology, and clinical characteristics of MGUS that are unique to this population. This brings me to my next question, should we be screening MGUS in asymptomatic individuals as we screen for prostate cancer by doing a PSA, as we screen for breast cancer by doing mammograms? Um, so I, I would say here that for screening to be useful, the test needs to be reliable. Overall, it must do more benefit than harm, and it must be something that people are going to accept. And the screening program should be of good value for money. We can't be wasting millions of dollars and not having any benefit from screening. So in the next slide, I will try to answer some of these questions so that we understand whether, sorry, uh, whether MGUS meet the criteria for screening or not. So the first question is, is there a recognized need Although rates of MGUS are low, MGUS carries a risk of complications. MGUS, there is a real but true risk of progression to malignancy. And we know that monitoring for MGUS can improve myeloma outcomes. So clearly there is a recognized need. Is there a simple screening test? Answer is yes. We have a safe, simple, validated screening blood test, which is acceptable to the target population. Do we have an intervention? I would argue that we need more evidence here. We yet do not have any um, evidence that will have direct benefit from screening for MGUS, but we could still offer increased monitoring to those with the highest risk of progression to malignant disease. Um, and also we yet do not know what the harms of screening would be. So maybe, uh, maybe for all we know that Diagnosing MGUS can cause unnecessary anxiety as is seen in women who are diagnosed with DCIS. Or, um, so unless we engage communities and persons with MGUS within the framework of a screening program, we cannot determine whether screening would be acceptable. So in this regard, we have our Iceland study that screened almost a major chunk of their population and will be having those results in the coming years. So the next question is, do we have a high-risk population? Screening entire population is not cost-effective. I won't go there. Instead, if we screen a targeted population which are at high risk of progression or which have high-risk features, then I think um, we are will be more effective. So African-American communities, for example, if we screen them, uh, it would be more effective. Or if we screen family members who have 
first degree relatives with multiple myeloma or MGUS, that high risk group would be more effective for screening. And it goes without saying that once we start screening, the population will not just find out MGUS, but will also find out other cases of plasma cell disorders. So we need to have an infrastructure to support the screening program. We need to have a clear pathway as to how we are going to manage these patients. Having said that, we have, um, I'm happy to inform that we will be launching this study. It is called CHAMP study, and it's the acronym Charlotte African American MGUS project. So this study will be assessing the prevalence, risk factors, and molecular determinants of MGUS among African American population in Charlotte metropolitan area. This study will be conducted in collaboration with IMF. So you heard about this M Empower Charlotte project. So we'll be leveraging their African American initiative for engaging and educating our local communities and primary care physicians for increased awareness and timely diagnosis of plasma cell disorders. During stage one of the study, we'll be screening 20,000 African Americans aged 30 years or older from the greater Charlotte area for AMGUS. And we anticipate that we'll at least have 1,000 screen positive cases. And from this, those who are diagnosed with AMGUS will then proceed to stage two of the study and will prospectively follow those cases for the next several years to determine what are the risk factors of progression. And, and it, this study will be the first of its kind that will provide scientific insight into the epidemiology of AMGUS in African-American population. And this study is different from other studies because this study will be focused on a geographically defined African-American population that can be monitored longitudinally. With this, I'll say, if we know better, we do better. So you can all help us so that we know better and we can do better. And I'll be happy to take my questions at the end. Thank you very much for your attention.